Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and uh, we are here for yet another half hour of libertarian thought and libertarian conversation, sometimes, not always, with uh, a guest who's at odds with the libertarian position. In this case, we're going to talk with somebody who um, is taking a position that a lot of libertarians agree with, but a few of us take kind of a dim view of it. Ronald Wick is a contributor to The American Thinker and one of the leading advocates of what he calls the Academic Bill of Rights. Now maybe, um, Ronald, you could explain to our viewers what the Academic Bill of Rights is and why, in your opinion, we need it. I don't think many people know about it, really. Well, first I'd like to uh, thank Hardfire uh, for inviting me here tonight. Uh, the Academic Bill of Rights has become necessary. Uh, it's promoted by David Horowitz, who's well known for his uh, remarkable journey from the far left to traditional conservatism. He was one of the uh, architects of the new left. He wrote Marxist tracts like the Free World Colossus. And through personal experiences, in, including a murder of a close friend by the uh, Black Panthers, uh, with whom he worked closely, he experienced what he calls second thoughts. Yes. And well, we'll get to his credentials later, but right now I want to know what the Academic Bill of Rights is and uh, why, why you think they're a good thing. The Academic Bill of Rights uh, proposes to protect academic freedom for both teachers and students. Uh, the feeling is that academic freedom is under assault on our campuses. There is a stifling orthodoxy of leftist opinion that has been imposed by faculties dominated by leftist radicals. The trend began in the late 60s. It accelerated through the 70s and 80s. Now you find humanities departments where there isn't a single conservative or libertarian voice. Uh, some top schools, you might find 70 professors across several disciplines, political science, economics, history. You won't find a single registered Republican. When you're talking about ratios of 40 to 1, 30 to 1, to speak of diversity is, is to just make a well, mockery. Now, would the Academic Bill of Rights ensure that um, a certain number of professors be Republican or communist, for that matter, or libertarian, or of a certain political stripe? No, it wouldn't. In fact, that's precisely what it does not purport to do. Uh, it's interesting that you raise the point because uh, leftist opponents of the Academic Bill of Rights will repeat this as a mantra. No matter how many times David Horowitz explains that hiring and tenure decisions will not be made on the basis of political affiliation or religious views, his opponents will continue to distort the issue and claim that what he's really looking for is some kind of conservative oversight of faculties. Okay, so is one of the items in the ac Academic Bill of Rights that um, tenure and promotion and hiring and so on will not be based on uh, political or religious beliefs? Yes, that is specified. Okay, and what are some of the other items? Well, uh, in, in discussing the protections afforded the student, um, academic freedom involves a learning environment that's conducive to the transmission of information. If a student is made to feel uncomfortable because he expresses uh, a religious belief or a political belief that's, uh, that falls outside the politically correct consensus that's been established on the campuses, well, that student fears uh, penalties. Okay, but now you use the term made to feel uncomfortable. To me, that is uncomfortably reminiscent of the uh, politically correct liberal types who will say, oh, he created a hostile environment because he's, mm. he's a Republican or something like that. Aren't you saying much the same thing that, um, s that liberal professors are creating a hostile environment or making people feel uncomfortable? Well, you actually raise a very good point here. Uh, the idea of avoiding a hostile environment is not to shut down debate. It's to encourage civility in debate. Now, if, it exp if a professor expresses an opinion and a student wants to challenge that opinion, there's no reason why the debate can't be conducted with civility. Uh, civility goes out the window when uh, discussions are replaced by name calling, uh, by mockery, when a student who, for example, supports Bush 
is made to feel that he's stupid or evil. Um, in so does the academic Bill of Rights specify that uh, there shall be no name calling or mockery or uh, calling people stupid or evil? Well, it specifies that uh, it, it's the professor's responsibility to encourage an atmosphere of tolerance, uh, of respect for the intellectual virtues. All of these things have been codified before. You see, the academic Bill of Rights wasn't created ex nihilo. Uh, the American Association of, Uni of University Professors in 1915 drafted their own code of academic freedom, uh, of protecting academic freedom and guidelines for proper behavior in the classroom. Now, we have no problems with those codes. In fact, they're in place in most colleges and universities around the country. Our problem is that these codes are openly flouted. They're not enforced. So to enforce these codes, uh, would you have the Academic Bill of Rights be adopted as federal legislation? No. In fact, the, the, the feds don't enter the picture in, on any level. Well, then would you have the individual states adopt a, um, the Academic Bill of Rights one by one? See, Horowitz has pointed out repeatedly that inviting legislative oversight is the last resort. Wherever a college is willing to police itself is willing to correct its own abuses. The Academic Bill of Rights requires no legislative oversight. See, now that's, that's where I have suspicions about the Academic Bill of Rights. I've heard similar things from, from Senator John McCain with regard to um, professional sports, with the late Senator Paul Simon with regard to violence on TV and in the movies. They're all saying, as legislators, they're saying, Either you regulate yourselves to our satisfaction, or we'll do it for you. Uh, it sounds to me like you're, in effect, threatening various colleges and universities that there will be controlling legislation if they don't adopt the sort of code that, that you think they ought to adopt. I, I, I largely share your concerns. The, the problem here is that we have to look at the origin of the problem in the universities. It doesn't start on the right, it starts on the left. In other words, there is a blacklist in place now for over two decades. Qualified conservative libertarian professors can't get jobs, they can't get tenure. Uh, libertarian economist, for example, simply won't get a job in the economics department of a top school. How do you know that this blacklist exists? Uh, it's, it's several educators on the right have written essays and columns about it. Uh, naturally, the left will say, oh, no, there is no blacklist. We, you know, our hiring and firing decisions are made on the basis of, of competence. Well, we have to look more closely and see the kind of people who are hired, and not just hired, who are repeatedly promoted. The poster boy, Ward Churchill. Now here's a fake Indian who shows up and announces that he is a Kitoa Cherokee. And the tribe disavows this. Yes, yes, well. But he survives all the vetting procedures. You see, the point is, he's, that is not, a remarkable story. he's not someone who slipped through the cracks. You go very, very wrong if you say this is an isolated incident and, oh, all right, he's a freak show, but he's not representative. That couldn't be more mistaken. Okay, well, I agree yeah. with you on that. Yeah. I think you're probably 100% correct. I think yeah. there are probably at least a few dozen other Ward Churchills around there. But I'm saying, wait a minute. What if, <clears throat> if uh, I am chairman of the board of trustees of a college, what if I want a nice, liberal, politically correct Marxist college that turns out nice little Marxists? That's what I want. Why shouldn't I have the right to hire loudmouth, politically correct Marxist Ward Churchill type professors. You if should. I want to. If you're a private college and this is the kind of college you want to run, that has nothing to do with us. The Academic Bill of Rights doesn't apply to private colleges. What we would expect is some truth in advertising. If you're billing yourself as a liberal, liberal arts university and your goal is not to turn out scholars but rather to turn out Marxist revolutionaries, 
well, let's, let's know in advance. In other words, let's not have parents spending $30,000 a year thinking their kids are getting well, an education. These reputations yeah. are developed over time, and yes. people find them out when they're exploring what college to send their children to. Sometimes they find out after they've been in the school for oh, six For example, months. I don't think anybody is unaware that Bob Jones University is a conservative Christian right. school or that Liberty University is a conservative Christian stu That's school. That's right. But they don't enjoy anything remotely approaching the cultural cachet of, say, Berkeley. Right. Now, Berkeley bills itself not as a factory for turning out Marxist revolutionaries, but, but as a top-tier school. Everybody knows no, it. No, but you're going to Berkeley to get a liberal arts education. You're, you're going there to learn the humanities. Mm -hmm. And that's not what their aim is. Now, somewhere along the way, the aim of education was seriously subverted, and you have professors on record as stating, well, all teaching is political. Uh, excuse me? It isn't supposed to be. Well, You know, you're, you're asserting this as a fact. In point of fact, you've made a very controversial statement. Well, now I would <laughs> say that in mathematics, that's probably mm. totally bogus. I don't think there's a Democrat mm. way and a Republican way of adding two plus two. Ah, uh, but there's but a geology professor who spends 15 minutes of his class time every period denouncing George Bush's war in Iraq. Now, whether you are for or against George Bush's war in Iraq, you don't want to hear it in a geology class. Well, I know. I would agree with you. But uh, has, have any steps been taken to discipline this fellow or no. to ask him to stick to geology and talk he, about Bush outside the classroom? He might have been asked, but he certainly will do as he pleases simply because there's nothing preventing him from doing it. No, okay. No serious well, then let's, let's talk about how your academic Bill of Rights would address that problem. In practice, what would it look like? Okay, the, again, the, the faculty members are responsible for setting up committees that will enforce standards of academic freedom. Uh, obviously, this involves goodwill on everyone's part. If you have a committee composed of leftist radicals whose goal is to produce revolutionaries, then they're simply going to wink at any professor teaching assistant or whatever who's not doing his job. Now, as Horowitz says, we don't want legislatures coming in and making decisions. In fact, the legislation that's been proposed so far uh, in Pennsylvania, for example, carries no statutory power. Uh, any legislative committees would simply well, be to prepare a case, report. In that case, what practical purpose does it serve? It raises the public's consciousness. I think the problem right now is that the left has sent up a smokescreen to the extent that people who have misgivings about what may or may not be happening on the campuses are reassured this is all conservative propaganda. It's just a, a crazy a fringe movement on the far right to take control of our campuses. Well. If you're, sa if you're satisfied with that explanation, you'll never look any deeper. You'll never find out what's going on. Then you have a Ward Churchill, or you have a Grover Fur. He's the fellow at Montclair University who says things like, uh, Joseph Stalin is a true Democrat, and the United States was morally wrong for trying to bring down the Berlin Wall. All right, now there are people who will quickly rise and say, well, do, do, do you want to... Uh, prevent him from making these statements, or well, I certainly don't want to make, prevent him from making any statement he likes outside the classroom. But you do have to ask yourself, if a guy is telling a captive audience of undergraduates that Adolf Hitler was a great man and he was nearly misunderstood, does he have the academic freedom to do this? Well, yes, I would say he does. Uh, in the classroom? Yes, in the classroom, I would say that he does, because in certain subjects, it's part of a professor's job to do research and uh, draw conclusions. Take, for example, history. Uh, I would say that um, a fellow who specializes in 20th century German history would be entirely within his rights to um, publish articles and books concluding, um, whether we agree with him or not, that uh, Hitler was a great man and that uh, we did him a great injustice by fighting against him and so on and so forth. And if that was his position, his published position, then um, it would be sheer hypocrisy to ask him to not say as much 
in his actual history lectures, with which, of course, his students would be free to disagree, don't you think? Well, two points. One, such a man would never get a job. He is uh, he's espousing the cause of the wrong genocidal maniac. Hitler was a monster, undeniably. He is roasting in one of the blackest pits in hell. But Stalin killed more people than Hitler. And you can say good things okay. about Stalin, and the New York well, Times then, won't mind. Okay, fine. Let's you talk know. about Stalin, then. Let's just take everything I said about Hitler yes. and apply it to Stalin. Does not a professor who specializes in 20th century Russian history have the right to publish books and articles stating that Stalin was a good man if that's what his research has shown him? And does he not then have the right to repeat those assertions in the classroom? Well, when you say if that's what his research has shown him, well, then he has to disregard the research that shows him the famines, the purges, the establishment of the gulag. Oh, I see. So the, the, um, the merit of his research and his conclusions would then have to be vetted by um, by who? By you? By Mr. Horowitz? By the history faculty of the school. Uh, okay. In other words, what we're saying is this. The Academic Bill of Rights specifies that there's a broad range of scholarly opinion, particularly in the humanities. There's less of a range in the hard sciences, sciences where s mathematical tru truths are established. Within the field of history, a broad interpretive range is permissible in the classroom. By broad, we don't mean all-inclusive. If a man wants to teach that the South won the Battle of Gettysburg, he's not competent to teach American history. Okay. He can certainly express his opinions on the causes of the Civil War, and he can point out where he disagrees with other interpretations. That's well within the range of scholarly opinion. But he can't falsify historical data. He can't omit large events and thereby change the picture. Okay. That means he's not doing his so you're, job. So you're saying that um, I, as a professor, could adopt and espouse a, an unpopular viewpoint as long as I did not base it on falsified research or on the uh, willful omission of uh, important evidence and so on and so we're forth? We're not trying to uh, suppress uh, colorful eccentrics. Uh, we're not uh, trying to remove uh, all idiosyncrasies from the university. What we are saying is that there are some views that are beyond the pale. You, you cannot, in a psychology class, teach that child molestation is okay. That's, that's simply, if you want to do well, why that... Not? Well, if you want to do that, well, for one thing, it's against the law. See, if you want to do this on it's your a, it's own... It's against the law to state an opinion? No, to molest a child. Yes, it's against yeah. the law to molest a now, child. Again, if you want to go outside, if you want to be an advocate for NAMBLA, mm -hmm. that's your business. What, mm -hmm. what you do out no. of the classroom is entirely your business. It's against the law to molest a child, yeah. to do murder, to do exactly. God knows what else. But is it, should it be against the law to say, I think that this or that action ought to be legal, or I don't see anything wrong in this or that action. Now, I'm not going around murdering people. I'm not going around molesting children. I admit that it's forbidden, and therefore I don't do it. But I say, in the abstract, I think murder's all right. Now, well, I should be barred from teaching? You, you could, for example, present that position in a philosophy class and invite the students to criticize based on their readings. Your, your ethical stance. Uh, you could ask them to do a comparative survey of uh, Eastern and Western thought. What do the great thinkers of the East say about murder? What do the thinkers of the West? What are the religious implications? What are the distinctions between various kinds of killing, justified killing, unjustified killing? Uh, get into the legal ramifications of when you are or are not responsible for committing a killing. To, to simply make a blanket statement that it's okay that killing another human, uh, killing another human being is fine. There's, there should be no uh, moral stigma attached to being a murderer. Well, once again, uh, if you held those views, you probably wouldn't get a teaching job. No, no uh, neither at Berkeley nor at Bob exactly, Jones. Exactly, exactly. As, as I say, certain opinions simply are beyond the pale. And for that, we don't really need an yeah. academic bill of rights to keep those people Well, out. see, here's the problem. Opinions that are repulsive, but can be considered right 
rightward opinions. Let's say uh, an advocate for slavery. Well, uh, repulsive opinion. Uh, no one in his right mind would advocate slavery. But the advocate of slavery can't get a job teaching anywhere. On the other hand, an advocate of Kim Jong-il's police state, he's not only can he get a job, he's got thousands of jobs on our campuses and universities. Now, slavery is a terrible thing. Are the people of North Korea much better than slaves? Uh, we can draw some fine distinctions, but certainly the person who advocates a totalitarian communist state is not morally much better than someone who's advocating slavery. I well, mean, now, wait a minute. They're both calling for the death of freedom. Here I, I am, uh, say I'm a professor of history, and I will point out to you that in some circumstances, um, back in medieval times, there was voluntary slavery, and it was considered a perfectly okay thing. Sure. If you were down on your luck and could not support yourself, then you would present yourself to uh, the local nobleman hmm. and say, I'll be your slave if you'll support me. And the nobleman would. And that was a voluntary arrangement, but it was slavery. Now, I say that's not a terrible thing. Well, there are gradations. I mean, being an indentured servant, uh, very much like being a slave, except that you have a contract, right. that there's light at the end of the tunnel. You know, uh, th the essence of slavery is that you've been stripped of your humanity. You have no rights that anyone need recognize. Now, I think everyone listening to us right now shares my view, your view, that this is, this is an evil. Uh, there's, there's really nothing good to be said for slavery. And uh, it is the accomplishment of the Western world, the liberal democracy okay. of the West, to but overthrow the institution of aren't slavery. We, aren't we kind of... Um, uh, quibbling about a philosophical point here. Sure, where, um, sure we are. I, I, I'm more interested in finding out what the Academic Bill of Rights will, uh, what effect it will have if adopted in practice. Uh, will it lead to um, more of the type of professors you like being hired and given tenure and so forth? And how can you be sure that it would? Well, the answer is I can't be sure that it would, but uh, we, we would at least hope that uh, hiring search committees would exercise some elementary fairness. Uh, if, you, if you assemble a list of 100 applicants and you immediately weed out everyone who is even remotely conservative, and that might include a centrist liberal Democrat. Okay, but look, I'm the, you know? I'm the chairman of the economics department, and yeah. I'm, a, I'm a good left winger. Mm -hmm. And I think that anybody who preaches laissez-faire capitalism is not only stupid, but evil. But in any case, he is certainly wrong. And if I think that he is wrong, why would I want him on my faculty? Maybe, maybe give him tenure so that he'd be poisoning the minds of children That's for the next exactly 40 years. That's exactly what has happened over the last 30 years. It starts out with student radicals becoming teaching assistants, becoming associate professors, getting tenure, becoming full professors. Now the radicals are in control. Uh, there's a, a principle of, of group dynamics that when you get a room full of people and mm -hmm. most of them are sort of in the center, the whole group tends to move in the direction of the extreme. Okay, but look, I've been in an academic setting for many, many years. I, I went to college in the 1970s, okay. and since my father is a university professor, I, I was living in a campus setting from infancy onwards. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot about it. and yeah. I. I seem to recall it's always been like this. We've always had a bunch of screaming lefties on the faculty because they're mostly just screaming lefty students who got a little older. And well, um, you're right, of course. And but and you know the old saying, everybody, anybody who's not a socialist at 20 has no heart. Anyone who's still a socialist at 30 has no brain. Well, okay, twas ever thus. We've always had noisy liberal professors who turn out noisy liberal students, and only a small percentage of them Not remain exactly. noisy liberals. Not exactly, though. David Horowitz uh, points out, he's, he's meant, made this point several times, he said, I was in school as a full-time student from 1944 to 1962. Now, he's, his parents were communists. He said his... They must have had yeah, an awful lot of money for communists yeah, if he was a student for that his long. His views <laughs> were obviously unpopular. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, at no time in his college education, during his college education at Columbia, was he made to feel uncomfortable. He was allowed to express his views if he could formulate cogent arguments, if he could... If well, he, but my God, at that time and place, there were tons of communists at Columbia. 
True, true, but I can say from my own experience that I uh, started out, I, I never went through a liberal phase. I started out as a conservative. The finest teacher I, I ever had in my life was a European history AP teacher I had in my senior year of high school. He was a socialist. I loved the man, though, because he just embodied, uh, he, he embodied learning to me. I mean, any time I raised an argument, he'd give me three books to read and say, okay. Here, here's, here's the people you, you have to be familiar with. Okay, so you aren't know? you a little bit afraid that a, a guy like, he, he, like him might be persecuted by your uh, academic bill of rights? You, you can't persecute an honest scholar. There's nothing to persecute him for. In other words, if, if but he... But here I am, a conservative now, and I'm saying, but this guy's not an honest scholar. He's a socialist. And we all know that socialism is totally discredited, so I'm not going to hire this The standards of honesty, guy. though, are objective. Uh, it's not subjective. In other words, if you present a reading list for the course, and your reading list is balanced, and you're not slighting Marxists, you're not slighting uh, original laissez-faire capitalist Smith and Ricardo, if you're, if you're teaching the monetarists, if you're teaching the Chicago School, if you're teaching the Austrians, you're presenting a balanced overview of economics. Now, I don't expect prejudices to be erased overnight. We're not human unless we have some prejudices. What we can do, though, we can own up to our prejudices and we can state as a principle that we will try to keep them out of that's, our presentation. That's an excellent concluding note, and yeah. since we only have a few seconds, uh, how should the uh, man in the street react to the Academic Bill of Rights, and sh how would he contact his, uh, whom should he contact if he wants to have it uh, adopted by his favorite college? First of all, he should go to frontpagemag.com. That's David Horowitz's site. There are many links to uh, students for academic freedom. Uh, there, are, uh, there are archives where you can read the various debates That's that Horowitz That's frontpagemag.com. That's folks. correct. That's a great idea. I'm going to go there myself and find out more about the Academic Bill of Rights. And thank you very much, Ronald Wick. And I'm Joseph Dobrian for Hardfire. Take it easy. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>